1230 A.D., the Domain Expeditionary Force completed the annihilation of the remaining remnants of the old Empire space fleet, operated by King Philip IV of France, who was deeply in debt to the Order. He paid his debt by seizing all of their wealth. The majority of the Templars fled to Switzerland, where they established an international banking system which secretly controls the economy of Earth. Old Empire operatives act as an unseen influence on international bankers. The banks are operated covertly as an uncombatant provocateur to covertly promote and finance weapons and warfare between the nations of Earth. Warfare is an internal mechanism of control over the inmate population. The purpose of the senseless genocide and carnage of wars financed by these international banks is to prevent the ISBEs of Earth from sharing open communication, cooperate together in activities that might enable ISBEs to prosper, become enlightened, and escape their imprisonment. Roswell, Alien Interview, Chapter 10, A Lesson in Biology, Matilda O'Donnell McElroy, Personal Note. My debrief was also tape recorded as a backup, and to add clarification to the stenographic note, I debriefed immediately after my interview so that everything that was said was still fresh in my mind. When I recounted these stories to the gallery stenographer, I was still reeling a bit. The perspective on Earth history from the point of view of the domain is very strange to say the least. I wasn't sure if my uncomfortable feeling came from being disoriented or if it came from being reoriented. Either way, I felt unsteady and confused. Yet at the same time, there was a ring of truth to it. I was elated and incredulous at the same time. The stenographer looked askance at me more than a few times as she recorded the history lesson <laughs> I passed on to her. I'm sure she thought I'd lost my mind. Maybe she was right. However, if my mind had been filled with hypnotic suggestions and false memories by the old empire, as Errol suggested, perhaps losing my mind would be a good idea. I didn't have much time to ponder my personal thoughts about these things at the time. It was my duty to get all the information I could from Errol and pass it on to the stenographer as soon as Errol was finished. My job was not to analyze the information, just report it as accurately as possible. The analysis would be left to the men in the gallery, or whomever else was receiving copies of the transcripts. I also delivered a list of books and materials requested by Errol to the agent in the gallery room so these could be gathered and delivered to Errol. Each night after I left Errol, she spent the rest of the night reading or scanning the materials which had been delivered to her. The members of the gallery each received a transcript of the stenographic dictation to study, each looking for information that was of interest to them. In the morning after breakfast, I reported back to the interview room to continue my interviews or lessons with Errol. Official transcript of interview, top secret, official transcript of the U.S. Army Air Force, Roswell Army Airfield, 509th Bomb Group, subject alien interview, July 28, 1947, first session. The origins of this universe and life on Earth, as discussed in the textbooks I have read, are very inaccurate. Since you serve your government as a medical personnel, your duties require that you understand biological entities, so I am sure that you will appreciate the value of the material I will share with you today. The texts of books that have been given on the subjects related to the function of life forms contain information that is based on false memories, inaccurate observation, missing data, unproven theories, and superstition. Who? For example, just a few hundred years ago, your physicians practiced bloodletting as a means to release supposed ill humors from the body in an attempt to relieve or heal a wide variety of physical and mental afflictions. Although this has been corrected somewhat, many barbarisms are still being practiced in the name of medical science. In addition to the application of incorrect theories concerning biological engineering, many primary errors that Earth scientists make are the result of an ignorance of the nature and relative importance of ISBEs as the source of energy and intelligence which animate every life form. Although it is not a priority of the domain to intervene in the affairs of Earth, the Domain Communications Office has authorized me to provide you with some information in an effort to provide more accurate and complete understanding of these things and thereby enable you to discover more effective solutions to the unique problems you face on Earth. 
The correct information about the origins of biological entities has been erased from your mind, as well as from the minds of your mentors. In order to help you regain your own memory, I will share with you some factual material concerning the origin of biological entities. I asked Errol if she was referring to the subject of evolution. Errol said, no, not exactly. You will find evolution mentioned in the ancient Vedic hymns. The Vedic texts are like folk tales or common wisdoms and superstitions gathered throughout the systems of the domain. These were compiled into verses like a book of rhymes. For every statement of truth, the verses contain many half-truths, reversals of truth, and fanciful imaginings blended without qualification or distinction. The theory of evolution assumes that the motivational source of energy that animates every life form does not exist. It assumes that an inanimate object or chemical concoction can suddenly become alive or animate accidentally or spontaneously, or perhaps an electrical discharge into a pool of chemical ooze will magically spawn a self-animated entity. There is no evidence whatsoever that this is true, simply because it's not true. Dr. Frankenstein did not really resurrect the dead into a marauding monster, except in the imagination of the Isbees who wrote a fictitious story one dark and stormy night. No Western scientist ever stopped to consider who, what, where, when, or how this animation happens. Complete ignorance, denial, or unawareness of the spirit as the source of life force required to animate inanimate objects or cellular tissue is the sole cause of failures in Western medicine. In addition, evolution does not occur accidentally. It requires a great deal of technology, which must be manipulated under the careful supervision of ISBEs. Very simple examples are seen in the modification of farm animals or in the breeding of dogs. However, the notion that human biological organisms evolved naturally from earlier ape-like forms is incorrect. No physical evidence will ever be uncovered to substantiate the notion that modern human bodies evolved on this planet. The reason is simple. The idea that human bodies evolved spontaneously from the primordial ooze of chemical interactivity in the dim mists of time is nothing more than a hypnotic lie instilled in the amnesia operation to prevent your recollection of the true origins of mankind. Factually, humanoid bodies have existed in various forms throughout the universe for trillions of years. This was compounded by the fact that the Vedic hymns were brought to Earth 8,200 years ago by the Domain Expeditionary Force. While they were based in the Himalaya Mountains, the verses were taught to some of the local humans who memorized them. However, I should note that this was not an authorized activity for the crew of the Domain installation, although I am sure it seemed like an innocent diversion for them at the time. The verses were passed along verbally from one generation to the next for thousands of years in the foothills and eventually spread throughout India. No one in the domain credits any of the material in the Vedic hymns as factual material any more than you would use Grimm's fairy tales as a guide for rearing children. However, on a planet where all of the Isbees have had their memory erased, one can understand how these tales and fantasies could be taken seriously. Unfortunately, the humans who learned the Vedic verses passed them along to others saying that they came from the gods. Eventually, the content of the verses were adopted verbatim as truth. The euphemistic and metaphorical content of the Veda were accepted and practiced as dogmatic fact. The philosophy of the verses were ignored, and the verses became the genesis of nearly every religion practiced on the planet except Hinduism. As an officer, pilot, and engineer of the domain, I must always assume a very pragmatic point of view. I could not be effective or accomplish my missions if I were to use philosophical dogma or rhetoric as my operations manual. Therefore, our discussion of history is based on actual events that occurred long before any Isbees arrived on Earth and long before the old empire came into power. I can relate part of this history from my personal experience. Many billions of years ago, I was a member of a very large biological laboratory in a galaxy far from this one. 
was called the Arcadia Regeneration Company. I was a biological engineer working with a large staff of technicians. It was our business to manufacture and supply new life forms to uninhabited planets. There were millions of star systems with millions of uninhabited planets in the region at that time. There were many other biological laboratory companies at that time also. Each of them specialized in producing different kinds of life forms depending on the class of the planet being populated. Over a long span of time, these laboratories developed a vast catalog of species throughout the galaxies. The majority of the basic genetic material is common to all species of life. Therefore, most of their work was concerned with manipulating alterations of the basic genetic pattern to produce variations of life forms that would be suitable inhabitants for various planetary classes. The Arcadia Regeneration Company specialized in mammals for forested areas and birds for tropical regions. Our marketing staff negotiated contracts with various planetary governments and independent buyers from all over the universe. The technicians created animals that were compatible with the variations in the climate, atmospheric and terrestrial density, and chemical content. In addition, they were paid to integrate our specimens with biological organisms engineered by other companies already living on a planet. In order to do this, our staff was in communication with other companies who created life forms. There were industry trade shows, publications, and a variety of other information supplied through an association that coordinated related projects. As you can imagine, our research required a great deal of interstellar travel to conduct planetary surveys. This is when I learned my skills as a pilot. The data gathered was accumulated in huge computer databases and evaluated by biological engineers. A computer is an electronic device that serves as an artificial brain or complex calculating machine. It is capable of storing information, making computations, solving problems, and performing mechanical functions. 1947. <laughs> In most of the galactic systems of the universe, very large computers are commonly used to run the routine administration, mechanical services, and maintenance activities of the entire planet or planetary system. Based on the survey data gathered, designs and artistic renderings were made for new creatures. Some designs were sold to the highest bidder. Other life forms were created to meet the customized requests of our clients. The design and technical specifications were passed along an assembly line through a series of cellular, chemical, and mechanical engineers to solve the various problems. It was their job to integrate all the component factors into a workable, functional, and aesthetic finished product. Prototypes of these creatures were then produced and tested in artificially created environments. Imperfections were worked out, modifications made, and eventually a new life form was endowed or animated with the life force or spiritual energy before being introduced into the actual planetary environment for final testing. After a new life form was introduced, we monitored the interaction of these biological organisms with the planetary environment and with other indigenous life forms. Conflicts resulting from the interaction between incompatible organisms were resolved through negotiation between ourselves and other companies. The negotiations usually resulted in compromises requiring further modification to our creatures or to theirs or both. This is the part of science or art you call eugenics. In some cases, changes were made in a planetary environment, but not often, as planet building is much more complex than making changes to an individual life form. Coincidentally, a friend and engineer with whom I used to work with at the Arcadia Regeneration Company a long time after I left the company told me that one of the projects they contracted to do in more recent times was to deliver life forms to Earth to replenish them after a war in this region of the galaxy devastated most of the life on the planets in this region of space. This would have been about 70 million years ago. The skill required to modify the planet into an ecologically interactive environment that will support billions of diverse species was an immense undertaking. Specialized consultants from nearly every biotechnology company in the galaxy were brought in to help with the project. 
What you now see on Earth is the huge variety of life forms left behind. Her scientists believe that the fallacious theory of evolution is an explanation for the existence of all life forms here. The truth is that all life forms on this and any other planet in this universe were created by companies like ours. How else can you explain the millions of completely divergent and unrelated species of life on land and in the oceans of this planet? How else can you explain the source of spiritual animation which defines every living creature? To say it is the work of God is far too broad. Every Isby has many names and faces in many times and places. Every Isby is a God. When they inhabit a physical object, they are the source of life. For example, there are millions of species of insects. About 350,000 of these are species of beetles. There may be as many as 100 million species of life forms on Earth at any given time. In addition, there are many times more extinct species of life on Earth than there are living life forms. Some of these will be rediscovered in the fossil or geological records of Earth. The current theory of evolution of life forms on Earth does not consider the phenomena of biological diversity. Evolution by natural selection is science fiction. One species does not accidentally or randomly evolve to become another species as the Earth textbooks indicate, without manipulation of genetic material by an ISBI. A simple example of ISBI intervention is the selective breeding of a species on Earth. Within the past few hundred years, several hundred dog breeds and hundreds of varieties of pigeons and dozens of koi fish have been evolved in just a few years, beginning with one original breed. Without active intervention by ISBIs, biological organisms rarely change. The development of an animal like the duck-billed platypus required a lot of very clever engineering to combine the body of a beaver with the bill of a duck and make a mammal that lays eggs. Undoubtedly, some wealthy client placed a special order for it as a gift for some curious amusement. I'm sure that the laboratory of some biotechnical company worked on it for years to make it a self-replicating life form. The notion that the creation of any life form could have resulted from a coincidental chemical interaction moldering up from some primordial ooze is beyond absurdity. Factually, some organisms on Earth such as proteobacteria are modifications of a phylum designed primarily for the star type 3 class C planets. In other words, the domain designation for a planet with an anaerobic atmosphere nearest a large, intensely hot blue star, such as those in the constellation of Orion's belt in this galaxy. Creating life forms is very complex, highly technical work for ISBs who specialize in this field. Genetic anomalies are very baffling to Earth biologists who have had their memory erased. Unfortunately, the false memory implantations of the old empire prevent Earth scientists from observing obvious anomalies. The greatest technical challenge of biological organisms was the invention of self-generation or sexual reproduction. It was invented as the solution to the problem of having to continually manufacture replacement creatures for those that have been destroyed or eaten by other creatures. Planetary governments did not want to keep buying replacement animals. The idea was contrived trillions of years ago as a result of a conference held to resolve arguments between disputing vested interests within the biotechnology industry. The infamous Council of Yumi Krum was responsible for coordinating creature production. A compromise was reached after certain members of the council were strategically bribed or murdered to author an agreement which resulted in the biological phenomenon which we now call the food chain. The idea that a creature would need to consume the body of another life form as an energy source was offered as a solution by one of the biggest companies in the biological engineering business. They specialized in creating insects and flowering plants. The connection between the two is obvious. Nearly every flowering plant requires a symbiotic relationship with an insect in order to propagate. The reason is obvious. Both the bugs and the flowers were created by the same company. Unfortunately, the same company also had a division which created parasites and bacteria. The name of the company roughly translated into English would be Bugs and Blossoms. They wanted to justify the fact that the old valid purpose of the parasitic creatures they manufactured was to aid the decomposition of organic material. There was a very limited market for such creatures at that time. 
In order to expand their business, they hired a big public relations firm and a powerful group of political lobbyists to glorify the idea that life forms should feed from other life forms. They invented a scientific theory to use as a promotion gimmick. The theory was that all creatures needed to have food as a source of energy. Before that, none of the life forms being manufactured required any external energy. Animals did not eat other animals for food, but consumed sunlight, minerals, or vegetables vegetable matter only. Of course, bugs and blossoms went into the business of designing and manufacturing carnivores. Before long, so many animals were being eaten as food that the problem of replenishing them became very difficult. As a solution, bugs and blossoms proposed with the help